more of that? And that's the question that we've been trying to answer the last couple of weeks. And we talked about the traditional method, how people typically try to treat this illness. They talk a lot about rights and duties and responsibilities. And we talked about how that's problematic. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And so then we offered an alternative method, and that is that we make our marriage, our view of marriage, and our approach to marriage an objective-based one. That Allah tells us what He wants us to get out of it, and so we make that what? Our goal, and we do the things that the Qur'an, the Hadith, and common sense tells us, well, what? Bring those things about. What will make us mutual garments for each other? What will make our living together acceptable? Okay? And what will produce love, tranquility, and peace, and mercy in the home, right? And so we started talking about that. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we talked about treating your spouse as you would like to be treated. We talked about treating your spouse. I didn't knock it down, I just want you to know that. Treating your spouse as you would like to be treated. We talked about that. And we mentioned uh, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where He said, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and women, they have rights over their husbands similar to the rights which their husbands have over them. And we talked about how Ibn Abbas explained that saying that it means, or he gave an example of how that plays out practically. He said, I beautify myself for my wife just like I like her to beautify herself for me. Just like I want her to look good for me, I do what? I do the same thing for her. I treat her the way I want to be treated. And we mentioned the important don't keep score which is that tendency on the part of couples to basically note down everything they do and assign a value to it. And then when their spouse does something, they also do what? They assign a value and they keep doing what? You know, keeping score. Oh, well, you know, you know I've, I've done all this. What have you done? What have you done for me lately? That attitude which creates bitterness, it creates resentment, all the things which undermine what marriage is supposed to produce. We talked about you know, lifting your partner up and not putting them down. That insults are something which should not be in a marriage. And if we can't get rid of them altogether, we have to minimize them. People have attended in the Prophet, he said in the Hadith, وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ Don't say to your wife you're ugly. Right? But this is a specific statement of the Prophet which can be considered in a general sense. Don't insult your wife. Don't put her down. Right? And that's the same goes for what? The wife to the husband. Don't put him down. Lift him up. Okay? Say positive things. Don't say negative things. If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. Then we talked about you can catch more flies with honey, which means being what? Being gentle. Allah is gentle and He loves gentleness. Be gentle with each other. Treat each other with kid gloves. And the sad thing is that we're going to talk about this a little bit further on when we're dealing with other people. Not the person who's closest to us. We treat them always with what? Kid gloves. And then the person who's closest to us and has the most right to our kindness, you know, we're just treating them like trash. It should be the opposite, but no. So when you deal with your wife, when you deal with your husband, treat them with what? Kid gloves. You can catch more flies with honey. Be gentle. And then we talked about accentuate the positive and how there's no such thing as a perfect spouse. Now they, you have these books, the ideal Muslim husband, the ideal Muslim wife, okay? Yeah, theoretically speaking, there is an ideal out there, theoretically speaking, but when we come to the practical side of it, okay, real life, it just doesn't exist because of kamalu, illah, that Allah is the exclusive owner of perfection. He's the one who's perfect. Everybody else is going to have what? Their faults and shortcomings. But just like they're going to have faults and shortcomings, just like, just like they're going to have cons, they're going to have what? Pros, right? They're going to have um, positive things that they do, positive things about them, and what we need to do is focus in on that, <coughs> accentuate that, and stop focusing on what? The negative things. You hear all these people talking about what their husband doesn't have, what their wife can't do. That's not the, uh, the attitude of the Muslim. The Muslim does what? Okay? Oh, but she does this, and she has this, and she gives me that, right? That's how we try to you know, accentuate the positive. As the Prophet said, that a believer doesn't, a believing man, he never despises a believing woman. If there's some quality she has that he doesn't like, he finds in her a quality, 
that he likes, right? So he accentuates the positive. Then by that, if we talked about spending quality time and how in today's world, in this capitalist society, where, some, where brothers are out there trying to make money and sometimes the sister is out there trying to make money, it's just like that. Sometimes you need two incomes to support a household, it happens. That when all that's going on, what happens is they lose sight of the importance of what? Spending time together. And so when that happens, that can lead to what? Them growing apart. So what they have to do is they have to make it a point to be creative and find ways to what? Spend time together. We talked about the Prophet, he would do chores in the house. His wives were busy doing things and he would do what? Joining in those chores so that they're what? Spending that time together. He would be creative, doing things that they normally would do separately, doing them what? Together. So maybe the wife always does a grocery shop, or the husband always does a grocery shop. Khalas, go grocery shopping together, right? Spend time, that time we're going to want spend it together, okay? There's no harm if um, she's doing, cleaning the kitchen, if you go in there and what? While she washes you, dry. dry. You sweep up the floor, and you guys can have a conversation while you're doing that, okay? So the point is, is that we try to be creative when, when our, t our schedules are tight. We try to be creative, but we make it a point to what? Spend time together, interact, to keep ourselves close. And by that, we talked about being affectionate. We had a lot of discussion about that last week. Heated debate. I almost got run out of the masjid. Being thrown, with tomatoes thrown at me and everything. <laughs> right? So we talked about that in detail. And that's something really important. The Prophet Sallallahu was keen. And he was our example. He was very affectionate with his wives, and so we should you know, be the same way. We should be the same way. He's the most excellent example for us in everything, not just in the way that he prayed, but also in the way that he what, interacted with his wives. He was very affectionate, and we should be affectionate as well. We shouldn't be afraid of being affectionate, and we shouldn't confine affection to what? To when we're in the bedroom and the lights are out. We talked about that. That brings us up to today. And so now we come to another point, which is live according to your means. Live according to your means. There's a lot of surveys that have been done recently that talk about the leading causes of divorce. It's a big problem in this country. Marriages don't what? They don't end well. And so people study why is that? You know, what are the leading causes? And one of the leading causes of divorce, you guessed it, Money issues, financial problems, right? People disagreeing about money, right? And that's because people typically in this world, this capitalist society, they link security, safety with what? With money. If we're not financially stable, we're what? You know, we're not safe, we're not secure. It's, you know, it becomes an issue, causes a great deal of what? Anxiety, and that anxiety creates what? Tension, bitterness, resentment, arguments about money. And this is rooted in the fact that a lot of people have a tendency to what? Live above their means. They spend money that they don't have on things that they don't need. And they live a lifestyle which is not consistent with what? With their paychecks. And so when they do this, they end up what? Having lots of things that they don't need, but the essential things they don't have. Or even worse than this, they start to do what? They find themselves in debt. Because if they don't have the money to buy it, what do they start doing? Buying things on credit, right? And when they start buying things on credit and creating this debt, that creates what? That creates arguing about money and where's the, you know, how the bill is going to get paid. And if the bills don't get paid, we're going to get evicted this and we're going to lose that, etc. And so these arguments lead to what? Enmity, bitterness, tension in the home, and all those things undermine what? The love the mercy, the tranquility, all those characteristics that are supposed to be what? In marriage, they do what? They undermine those. So you have to, you have to think that you can't do something which is basically you want to want to counter, it's counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve. So we have to what? As they say, act your wage. Live within your means. The Thumba Dalek, appreciate your spouse and never take them for granted. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in the hadith, مَن لَا يَشْكُرْ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرْ اللَّهِ Whoever doesn't thank the people, 
then he has not properly thanked Allah. So a lot of people, they actually have this attitude, like, I don't say thank you, I thank Allah. I thank Allah. No, you haven't thanked Allah if you haven't thanked your spouse, if you haven't thanked your husband, if you haven't thanked your wife. And no one should think that something is too small to say thank you. No one likes to be taken for granted. No one likes to be made to feel that, oh, well, you had to do that. You're supposed to do that. So why should I say thank you? And this is critical, too, because reflect briefly on your spouse. This is not always easy because when they're there, as they say, when you have something, it's easy to take it for what? Granted. But I want you to just try to think and reflect for a moment about all the things that your spouse does for you. All the things that your spouse means to you. And I want you to think about all those things and what life will be like without them. If that person was taken, they could be taken in what? In an instant. And when they're gone, who's going to iron that shirt? Who's going to make that lunch? Right? Who's going to do that laundry? Who's going to say when you're leaving the door, be careful, be safe, come back home to us in one piece. I love you. Who's going to say that? You got to reflect upon that and then that will make you want appreciate that person the way they ought to be appreciated. And don't be the person who what? Who has that attitude, she ain't going nowhere. He ain't going nowhere. And maybe they're not going anywhere on their own volition. But Allah can do what? Can take them away. So sometimes we get complacent and we get comfortable and we think, oh, she's not going to go anywhere. She's got this good thing. She's not going anywhere. Or the wife might say the same thing. And yeah, that might be true. On his own volition, he's not going. On her own volition, they're not going. But Allah can do what? Can snatch him out of this world in the blink of an eye. And so don't take him for granted. Appreciate him while they're there. Because the time could come when what? When they're gone. And then you'll be filled with regret. So that's another important thing we need to do. Say thank you. Say jazakallah khair. You know, say those things even when they do something that you think is your right, or they're supposed to do. Feel pathetic. Get your priorities straight. And this is a real important one. We kind of alluded to it earlier, and we're going to really emphasize it here. Get your priorities straight. After your parents and your blood relatives, no one, no one, has more right, no one is more deserving of your good character, your kindness, your honor, your respect, your good manners, than your spouse. So you need to make sure your, your behavior reflects this. And we have a tendency to put so many people ahead of what? Our spouse. Nobody should be ahead of them except mom and dad, and what? Your relatives. Nobody should be ahead of your spouse after that. And Imam Ahmed and Nasai, they've collected and Al Hakim has authenticated the hadith on the authority of Aisha in which she said that she asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Man a'dhamun nasi haqqan al mara She said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who has the most right over a woman? He said, Zawjuha. He said, Her husband. Her husband has the most right. Reflect on that. And then reflect on your behavior. Do you really make your husband the number one priority? Or is there a tendency to want to put other people above your husband? We're going to see. I'm going to give you some examples. And you ask yourself, is that me? We also have the hadith by Tirmidhi on the authority of Aisha. In which the Prophet وسلم, he said, خيركم خيركم لأهلي وانا خيركم لأهلي. He said, the best of you are those who treat their wives the best, and I'm the best of you in the treatment of my wives. And Imam al-Shawkani, he comments on this hadith, and he says, 
على أعلى من الناس أم صار على أعلى الناس رتبة في الخير وحقهم بالاتصاف به وهو من كان خير الناس لأهله فإن الأهل هم لحقاء بالبشر وحسن الخلق والإحسان وجلب النفع ودفع الضر. He says the hadith calls attention to the person who has reached the highest level of goodness. Who doesn't want to be the person who reached the highest level of goodness? He says this hadith tells you who's reached that level and who is most deserving of being described with it. And he is the one who treats his family the best. For indeed, one's family are those most entitled to a pleasant expression, good character, kind treatment, acts of benevolence, and protection from harm. He goes on to say, فَإِذَا كَانَ الرَّجُلُ كَذَلِكَ فَهُوَ خَيْرُ النَّاسِ وَإِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْعَقْسِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَهُوَ فِي الْجَانِبِ الْآخَرِ مِنَ الشَّرِ He says, whenever a man is like this, he is the best of people. And whenever he is the opposite of this, then he is on the other side of the spectrum of evil and wickedness. He goes on to say, وَكَثِيرًا مَا يَقَعُ النَّاسُ فِي هَذِهِ الْوَرْطَةِ فَتَرَى الرَّجُلَ إِذَا لَقِيَ أَهْلَهُ كَانَ أَسْوَأَ النَّاسِ أَخْلَاقًا وَأَشْجَعَهُمْ نَفْسًا وَقَلَّهُمْ خَيْرًا وَإِذَا لَقِيَ غَيْرَ الْأَهْلِ مِنَ الْأَجَانِبِ لَانَتْ عَلِكَتُهُ وَانْبَسَطَتْ أَخْلَاقُهُ وَجَادَتْ نَفْسُهُ وَكَثُرَ خَيْرُهُ He says, and many people fall into this error. Listen to this. You see a man, if he enters his home, he is the worst of people in manners, the most intimidating, and the least kind and compassionate. But if he meets his companions and comrades, he is soft-spoken, well-mannered, easy-going, and extremely generous. Then he goes on to say and concludes, وَلَا شَكَّ أَنَّ مَنْ كَانَ كَذَلِكَ فَهُوَ مَحْرُومُ التَّوْفِيقِ زَائِغٌ عَنْ سَوَاءِ الطَّرِيقِ نَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ السَّلَامَ He says, and there can be no doubt that whoever is like this has been forbidden success and has deviated from the right way may Allah protect us. So what this means is it is incumbent upon the two spouses, husband and wife, to get their priorities straight and to make their partners the primary recipient, underline that word, primary recipient of their graciousness and kind treatment. They have to avoid this common mistake that Ashokan is referring to in his commentary. And that is how, and, th and this behavior contributes to what? The ruin of the marriage. How many times does a man come home to a wife who doesn't take care of herself? She doesn't fix her hair. She hasn't showered. She hasn't put on nice clothing. Maybe she's been cleaning in like some sweatpants and a sweatshirt. And that's what she, he comes home, that's what he comes home to. It's stained, it smells, and that's what he comes home to. And then when he asks her, you know, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't, you know, fix yourself up a little bit before I came home. You know, I come home every day at four, right? She says, I was too busy. I was too this. I was too that. She has a lot of excuses and he just eats it. But then someone calls. There's a dinner party. There's a wedding reception. And she goes and she what? Makes herself up. She does her hair. She puts on makeup. She puts on a nice dress. Right? And she goes out like a beauty queen. You don't see, you don't think he notices that? That when it's other people, I can what? I'm not too tired, I'm not too sick, I'm not too busy. I can make time to what? Make myself up. But for him, I don't have time. He comes home and he wants to talk. He needs to vent. You know, I had a rough day at work, man, and you know what they were doing, and I don't have time to talk. I don't want to talk. I don't feel like talking. But then she gets a phone call. It's sister so-and-so with the, with the new gossip. And she's got what? All the time in the world to talk. You don't think he notices that? You don't see how he feels like what? Like what? He's pushed back on the, on the list of what? Of priorities. I'll get to you. Right now, sister so-and-so's on the phone. You follow what I'm saying? This plays out. And it's haram. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Now your husband has what? You're going to make yourself up? Make yourself up for what? Your husband. You, gonna get, you got something to say? You got ears to listen? Listen to your husband. Make him... 
the priority. Okay? I'm too tired to cook. You need to go buy something. You go out there and buy something. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. I'll treat you. Okay? But then what? So-and-so calls. Oh, you know, sister so-and-so is sick. We all going to cook for her. All right. And it starts what? Banging pots together. You don't see, you don't think he sees that play out in front of him? He might not say anything, but he sees himself being what? The last on your list of priorities. And that hurts. And that creates bitterness. It creates resentment. It creates hatred and enmity. And it pushes what? Pushes him away from you instead of bringing him, bringing him close. Don't buy that, Dick. Consider and respect your spouse's sensibilities. The reality is that when two people get married, they bring into their marriage certain what? Certain sensibilities, certain things that annoy them, certain things that they don't necessarily like. And these are not things that are just fleeting. Oh, I can just easily ignore that. No, it's something that what really what? bothers them. And so what we try to do as husband and wife is we try to respect those sensibilities and not what? Not do those things that what? Create annoyance, upset them to no end. We try to do those things intentionally. We try to avoid that. Out of respect for what? For their sensibilities and what bothers them and what annoys them and they can't what? They can't get past it. And people don't, they shouldn't get bogged down with this attitude of what? It's not haram. Why do I have to give it up? You give it up because what? Because it will make them feel good. And so you're making a sacrifice for their feelings or their sensibilities, just like you want them to what? To give up certain things because of what? It annoys you. It bothers you. And we have an example of this from the life of the Sahaba, the life of the companions. We have that famous story of Asma bint Abi Bakr, who talks about you know, her um, relationship with her husband. Who was her husband, by the way? I need some candy so I can give out as a reward. So cousin, who was the husband of Asma? Az-Zubair. Hassan, Az-Zubair. So she talks about, huh? So she talks about her relationship with him and she says, I used to carry grain on my head from a Zubair's plot, which the Prophet had allocated for him to cultivate. It was about two-thirds of a farsakh, which is about a mile and a quarter from the city center. And it's not a mile and a quarter with what? Some asphalt. Right? This is a mile and a quarter with what? Rugged terrain. People who are what? Poor. And sometimes shoes, or you know those leather socks that people wear? That was shoes. Okay? And some of them didn't even have that. So she's saying I would walk, I would walk a mile and a quarter from his plot with what? With grain on my head. Is that tough? Is that easy? It's not easy, okay? One day I was on the road carrying grain on my head and I met the Prophet ﷺ and a group of his companions. He called out to me and stopped his camel so that I could ride behind him. He was going to give her what? A lift. Instead of having her what? Walk with that grain on her head on this rugged terrain for a mile and a quarter. Anything wrong with that? Anything wrong with that? Is it haram? No. Not haram. If it was haram, the Prophet wouldn't what? Wouldn't offer a ride, right? She said, I felt shy and thought of a Zubair's jealousy. I remembered what? He's jealous. This is the Prophet. The, the, he, won't, he won't mind. And it's a mile and a quarter. No, I remember what? His jealousy. He wouldn't like that. Even if he didn't say anything, he wouldn't what? He wouldn't like it. This is what his sensibility. So she says, what? He was the most jealous of men. So she what? She just stood there. The prophet, sensing my discomfort, he rode on. And I did what? I kept walking. So this is the, this is, these are the kind of little sacrifices that we make for what? Our spouse. Consider and respect your spouse's sensibilities. Okay, we have time. Let's do this one. Another important thing that's going to bring about that love and affection and tranquility and peace in the marriage that we seek is to compromise and be content. Don't always think the grass is greener on the other side. Rather, the grass is greener what? 
when you water it. Right? Ibn al-Qayyim, he said that whenever the wife of the Prophet, Aisha radiallahu anha, whenever she wanted something which was not prohibited, but not his preference, it wasn't something that he wanted, necessarily wanted to do, but it's something that she wanted. He acquiesced, went along with her, and did what? What she wanted. He did what? He compromised. Okay? He compromised. He also mentions, rahimahullah ta'ala, his guidance and his practice when it came to food. He didn't refuse anything prepared for him. And he never requested that anything unavailable be brought to him. No wholesome food was ever placed in front of him, except that he ate it. Unless he had a natural aversion to it, in which case he would leave it without prohibiting its consumption. So the Prophet ﷺ in this case, he's what? Being content. Being content. Whatever they have, I accept it. I'm just what? Content. So these are two qualities the Prophet demonstrates. Compromise and being what? Content. Not being a person who what? Demands what's not available. Asks for what they don't have. But just what? Content. Content. I made this. Is that okay? Yeah, it's more than okay. You follow me? Just be content. We come to a very important one and we'll probably close with this one. I had two slides for that. I'll give you guys a second to read some of those. Those are pretty good. All set? All right. So this is an important one, and we'll probably close with that one. Advise and be advisable. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in the hadith, ad-din nasiha religion is sincerity and sincere advice. And he said it three times. And he used to take the Pledge of Allegiance from his companions with the condition that those who pledge would give sincere advice to every Muslim. So this was something that was very important in the deen. He used to emphasize it a lot. Giving what? Advice. And that's because we are all human. We're all what? Insan. Right? And some of the scholars, they say that we're called insan because of kathrat nisyanina. Because we what? We forget a lot. And so since we forget a lot, we need to be what? Reminded. We need to be advised. We need to be admonished from time to time, so that we can better fulfill our obligations. And who do you think is best suited to fulfill this task? Somebody who's what? The closest to you. They can see you in a way that nobody else can see you. And if they really care about you, that caring is going to motivate them to what? To tell you, hey, you need to sh shore this up, right? And they can tell you in an intimate way, a private way, that won't make you feel what? Demeaned, denigrated, put down, right? So they're probably the best person if they what? If they know how to do it, if they know how to go about it. So it's, a, it's critical for spouses to adopt this policy of open what? Open communication. And they give each other ample opportunities to give what? Feedback. And they encourage discussion. This is critical in order for them to achieve the goals of marriage, the goals of what? Tranquility, love, mercy, being a garment for each other, etc. I'm going to ask you honestly, how can a husband and wife, how can one of them communicate their unhappiness? How can they do that? How can they convey their dissatisfaction? How can they point out the problems and offer some solutions to those problems if the doors of communication are, one, are shut? They can't do that. If they feel that their partner is unwilling to what? To listen. I don't want to hear it. If they feel like that, there's no way they can what? Talk about the problem and fix it. <clears throat> How can a husband or wife know if they're doing something wrong if their partner would rather do what? Keep their feelings huh, bottled up. 
I don't want to talk about it. If they keep bottling it up, there's no way I can know what's wrong so I can fix it. So you have to what? You have to communicate and talk about what's bothering you. So we said that what's critical is two things. There's two sides of it. Advise and be advisable. Advise means tell your spouse when they've done something wrong or when something they have done bothers or upsets you. What? Tell them. Open your mouth and tell them. Communicate this. Rather than do what? Complain. Tell them what they can practically do to make things right. So don't just complain, because that's what some people do. They just, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. Okay, well, how can I fix it? You did this, you did this. They just keep what? Complaining. No, let's talk practically about what? This is what happened. Now how can we get past it? That's what advise means. Okay? Be advisable, what does that mean? It means be someone that your spouse can be candid with. Be someone that your spouse can be candid with about his or her feelings. And how your behavior is affecting them. They need, you need to be somebody who what? You can say it. Say what you need to say. Shoot me with both barrels. And I can do what? I can swallow it. Don't be that person who your spouse, because of how you're going to react, they can't what? They can't be candid. And they have to be quiet. And they have to bottle things up because I can't tell you anything. Because you just what? You fly off the handle. Don't be that spouse who, when your spouse says, okay, hey, you know, you did this thing. Oh, you want to point out faults. Oh, well, I can, I can point out some of yours. And they do what? They take out <laughs> this long list, right? Don't be that spouse because when you do that, they won't want. They won't be candid. Don't be that spouse who, when somebody advises you, you, what? you shut down. Even when the criticism is highly constructive, you don't like anyone to tell you that you've done something wrong, and so you just what? You shut down. Don't be that spouse. Be the spouse who what? You can tell me, and I won't. My attitude won't change. Some spouses, they won't advise because the spouse, when they tell them something, is going to start what? pouting. She's going to start pouting or he's going to start pouting. And they have this attitude of what? Indignation. Like they've been oppressed. You oppressed me by saying X or by telling me Y. And so they just they go through the whole marriage unhappy. They're unhappy because every time they want to just say they have to be, they're just miserable because every time they want to say something, to their spouse, just point out a, a little mistake and be highly constructive in their criticism, the spouse will do that. They'll start to cry and get upset, and so to avoid that, they just won't. They keep their feelings bottled up, and so they go through the whole marriage day, miserably. You can't have it. You can't, you can't achieve tranquility, peace, love, mercy if you don't communicate. If you don't advise, you tell them what's bothering you, and you're not advisable. That they can come to you and say, hey, you know, when you do this, it really hurts my feelings. And you respond, I didn't know that. Okay, let's, you know, let's figure out how we can, that's how your marriage has to be. It can't be a thing where he can't tell you anything because you're going to shut down, you're going to cry, you're going to start slamming doors. You can't, you can't have that. We'll stop there. If you guys have any questions, comments, or complaints, or critiques, we'll take those briefly before we can make the then and offer our prayer. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد. We have another um, section or two to do, and we'll be complete with this topic. So we'll be back again next Monday on this, and and that's it. Any questions? Father. Okay, okay. Let me give the. Uh, let me do that. All right. So we said next week the fifth. We will have class, and it will be again at 7 o'clock. And if you can come a little earlier, that'll be good because Maghrib is creeping back, and so it's limiting the amount of time that we do have. So Monday the 5th, we will have class 7 p.m. September the 12th, no class. There won't be any class. Inshallah, we'll resume Monday the 19th, but that class will be after Al-Maghrib. After Al Maghrib. So between Maghrib and Isha for that class on Monday. Um, the Sheikh had suggested that we move the class from Monday to Tuesday. I don't want to make a big change like that because I'm afraid I'll lose you guys. 
And so we're just going to stick with Fundi after the Maghrib. Uh, and then the last thing was the Janazah for uh, Brother Amin's wife tomorrow after the Hope. Any questions? Any other questions? Comments? That you guys don't ask questions. And I don't know if it's shyness or what it is, but if you have something in your mind, ask it. Say it. Uh,